Jonathan, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. If you'd like to see any of the, the pictures of the, the, the uh, strange childhood uh, hobbies I used to have, uh, the, those are on my website and my, I think in my bio section. And they're very cute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, lots of, lots of uh, brightly colored spandex for the figure skating. So uh, uh, thank you for the introduction, Robin, and thank you guys for having me. Uh, I'm going to jump into some of my work. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of give you guys a starting with kind of some of my older projects and work my way towards the stuff that's on display currently um, at your at your at your space there in Texas. And uh, I kind of talk about how my work has shifted from more of a kind of anthropological typological uh, practice to a more socially engaged practice. Um, and which has also led to this some of the thing, the more recent things that are happening for me, uh, like my fellowship that I'm currently in the middle of. Um, and the, if anyone has questions, just feel free to pop them into the chat, and I'll, I'll, you know, I can address them as I'm going along, um, and then we can always do a Q and A at the end. Uh, so I'm going to jump in, starting here. Let me screen share here. So you guys can see an image here? Yeah. So the, the, pr the project I'm gonna start with is one of my oldest projects. It's still ongoing. Uh, I've been working on this project since 2010. Uh, the images I started making, I started making the images in this project while I was an undergrad at uh, Cal State Long Beach. Um, so this was, this wasn't even my, this wasn't my thesis work actually. It was sort of like a, a side project that I was working on um, while I was at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, I, I did have a show there. Uh, but these are all photographs of people in their cars uh, in, in Los Angeles. Um, uh, some of these, like this one, was taken recently, just this last summer. Um, but the, the people in the cars don't know they're being photographed. These are all candid, candidly made. Uh, the way I do this work is uh, I have a car with a camera mounted in the back and I drive around the streets of LA and whoever pulls up behind me is just the person that ends up being the subject of my photograph. Um, and uh, I don't even hold the camera, it's on a tripod. I, I'm driving the car, I use the rear view mirror to frame the shot. So like the rear view mirror is basically like my viewfinder. Um, I have someone sitting next to me with a little with a laptop and it's connected to the camera so that when I take the pictures we can check focus and exposure and then I have a second person driving another car that pulls up alongside the people in the car that I'm photographing that has a uh, flash mounted uh, mounted in the car so when I take the picture the flash fires in the car over here can you see my cursor uh, so like the, there's a lighting car over here that that would um light the inside of the the, the vehicle and the image so um, there you know i don't ask for permission when i make these images people don't know i'm making these images um and as you can see the car is centered in the middle of the frame there's a very similar composition and lighting it's just this very similar to a german school burned in hilla becker kind of way of making photographs, typological study of LA drivers and their cars. Uh, so this is the work that kind of uh, started me off um, back when I was an undergrad. Uh, and this is the work that kind of has gotten the most press, you know, the New Yorker stuff and the, the radio stuff. Um, the, the way I did this, the, so when I started this project, as I'm, I'm, I started thinking of it in a very anthropological way. I, I have a minor in cultural anthropology, um, and you know it's very kind of pulled back and distant. I don't interact with my subjects, uh, and while I like the project, you know one of the main reasons I like to make photographs is I like to meet people and talk with people, get to know their stories, um, and uh, so as I've kind of gone on from this work, um, I've moved into making much more collaborative kind of work. 
Um, that's not to say I don't enjoy this work or that I don't, I don't still, uh, I still don't, I still make this work. Um, but uh, there's definitely been a shift in the way that I, I'm trying to think about making imagery. Um, where, and, and trying to have sort of uh, less sort of stringent rules on how, how I might make a, a particular body of work or a certain project. And if anyone has questions about how I made this work, feel free to jump in and ask. This is the work that was recently shown at Photo LA and that my gallery is most interested in. So were people not surprised and startled by the flash coming in from the side? Um, it's in the middle of the day, the flash. Uh, so typically I would say most people don't react. Uh, I would say probably like 80% of people don't even react at all when the, when the flash goes off. Uh, some people, some people will kind of look around like maybe what was that? What happened? Um, and you know, there's a very, very small subset of people that um, figure out that you know the the light in the car to the side and the camera that they maybe see in my car in the front, um, you know, that there's something going on together and that they were they were being photographed. Um, so I you take one photograph and drive away. So you know, this is all done at stoplights. Um, my car's not moving. Their car's not moving. It's just done at, in traffic and in on LA streets. So mostly, no, I don't get. I, there's usually not much of a reaction. And then some people, they'll pull up alongside me and they'll go, hey, did you take my photograph? And I go, yeah, it's for an art project. And I go, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it's, it's a very, uh, I mean, LA where everyone's filming everything, it's, it's very much that, um, you know, it's not that unexpected in Los Angeles. Um, so moving from that, uh, after living in LA for all my life, I, moved to move to China. Um, <laughs> uh, I was living in China from 2016 until uh, the fall of 2017, but I've had recent I've had trips back. Um, I moved out there to do some work for several months for a friend of mine who I knew from community college and he was uh, living out there had a really has a really nice had a really nice career out there and he wanted to take some time off um, but he wanted someone to handle his editorial jobs and commercial jobs while he was gone so he said hey why don't you come out you know he knew I was kind of in between some things and said why don't you come out live in my apartment take care of my jobs for me and just keep all the money and I said sounds like a great plan um, so I went out there um, ended up meeting my wife there got married um, and uh, made a lot of work out there. Um, one of the projects I was working on um, was this project that I'm showing you right here. Uh, it's about a, it's it's all made in one building called Chungking Mansions. It's in Hong Kong, and uh, I lived I didn't live in Hong Kong. I lived about an hour away, um, but I would spend a lot of time in Hong Kong. And uh, this this work um, was part of the work I applied to grad school with. Um, and then while I was in grad school, I received a, a fellowship um, a grant uh, to then go back to Hong Kong and continue working on the project between my first and second year of grad school. Uh, so, the, so this project is all photographed within one building uh, in, in Hong Kong, in the Kowloon area of, of Hong Kong, if anyone's familiar. And uh, it's largely the hub of the non-Chinese immigrant community there. So there's a lot of people that own shops there, a lot of people that um, work in these shops, uh, a lot of, um, and it's, it's a highly diverse place, like more diverse than probably most neighborhoods in, in like that I've been to in Chicago, you know, like in, in, in cities like Chicago, in America in general, we have a lot of our kind of ethnic enclaves, you know, you've got Chinatown, you've got Little India, um, in, and in Hong Kong, because the, the non-Chinese immigrant community is such a small, small percentage of the entire population, it's, it sort of becomes that anyone who's not Chinese and is sort of working class congregates in this, within this one building. 
So this place is both little India, little Pakistan, the unofficial African quarter of the, of the, of the city. Um, it's where all the European backpackers come and stay when they're passing through. Um, and, uh, you know, all the, all of the Filipina, um, maids who, who work in the city, a lot of them end up here at one of, there's a restaurant there that they come to get local, like their, their food from back home. Uh, so it's, it's a really wonderfully diverse and interesting place. Um, um, but it's also considered by many of the local Hong Kongers as sort of the, you know, the, the place where the others are from, you know, the, this is, uh, there's a long history of representation of this place as being dangerous or, um, you know, someplace where you need to like kind of watch yourself or like maybe you wouldn't go there. And a lot of that stems from racial um, stereotyping and prejudices, uh, you know, much like the way things happen in the U S uh, about a certain part of town being dangerous or um, what have you. So I spent a lot of time there because it's one of the cheapest places to stay in the city. Um, but uh, I got to know a lot of the people there and um, it's, I really wanted to make a project about the community that is within this building uh, and, and kind of try to break down some of those, uh, the visual stereotypes that people use when they photograph the place. So like a lot of the ways, times the, a lot of times the way the place is photographed is it's photographed in a really kind of frenetic and busy and kind of overwhelming, crazy way. Um, and I was trying to look for still and quiet moments of the space as well as individual kind of portraits of, of the people that, you know, live there, work there and own businesses there. So the reason I'm showing you this work is because it's really connected a lot to what I was doing in Chicago, which is the work that was on display um, at your school. Just gonna push through some of these in a second here. So part of the group of people that are that are that are represented in this project um, there's a large group of asylum seekers and refugees um, who are part of this community um, like the last three people I just showed like this gentleman is um, his name's John and he's he's from Iran he fled Iran because he he was tortured by by the police in Iran um, because he was associated with some friends who were out protesting and they, even though he wasn't doing that himself, they just lumped him in with that group of people and you know, would pick him up off the street and, and subject him to literal torture. So he's, he fled Iran in fear of his life and is living in this kind of tenuous state in, within this community in Hong Kong. I'm not sure where he's going to end up. Um, He's been there for quite some time. Um, this gentleman has kind of this, his name's Innocent. He has this kind of wonderful success story going from being um, an asylum seeker to literally working for Goldman Sachs um, in Hong Kong. Uh, so what's one of the things that's also really interesting about this place is that there's this wide, um, diverse group of people, not just sort of uh, nationally and ethnically but um, but also kind of economically. Uh, this place is situated in one of the busiest shopping centers in the city and is prime real estate. So people that own property there are literally multimillionaires. Um, and then there are people who are subsisting on very meager kind of government um, uh, stipends for living as asylum seekers. This is Dennis. Dennis is the head of security at uh, Chunking Mansions and grew up in the building. Abdi is the city, is like the main translator for the Somali community in the city. 
Uh, and uh, so whenever a Somali person needs to be in court, uh, he, he is, he's hired by the city to be an official translator if they need him. Typical room at Chunking Mansions. Enter from the foot of the bed, walls on either side, very, very small rooms. And this is Sharmake, my very good friend who assisted me on the project and helped make a lot of introductions and um, became my go-to photo assistant for the project. So uh, I'm gonna jump into the work that's on display. Um, uh, currently at, in, at your SRO gallery. So this work, um, there's a very similar kind of approach, um, photographing within small build businesses in Chicago. Um, these are all, this is this, the project of this work is immigrant owned. Uh, it's all photographs made within immigrant owned um, businesses in the city. And uh, I photographed initially um, just, I was initially photographing just the spaces without people in them. Um, and eventually after, but you know, I would go to a place, I'd make these images. Um, you know, I would just walk into businesses and ask people if I could make images of their business and talk to them about their business. And, um, you know, uh, photographing someone's space is kind of a much smaller ask than ask than having someone sit for a portrait, for example. So um, just to give you an idea of like the process of how this works, you know, I, I might walk in, I'd see someone's hair salon and say, hey, I'd really like to photograph your salon. And would you mind telling me about how long you've been here? You know, you know, how did you, how did you open the business or something like that? And, you know, people don't usually mind if I'm photographing the space. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd come back, I'd bring prints of the, of the images I've made. And then, uh, you know, I might ask to do a portrait of someone if they were willing. Some people say yes, some people say no. I'd say I generally get more yeses than nos. Um, but uh, together, it's, it works in a similar way, photographs of interior space and environmental portraits of people that work in these spaces, um, own, own these businesses. Like this is right down the street from my house, just several blocks away in, in Pilsen. Quite a few images made within the, the neighborhood that I live in. One of the things that's um, become, I kind of knew would would happen, but becomes a little more real as I'm making the project. As I, as I return to try to give people pictures, maybe uh, you know I waited a little longer than I had planned and I show up to give people pictures and the business is closed and something else is there. Um, uh, like this particular little little thrift shop, you know, is now like a vintage clothing store instead. It's, you know, completely changed ownership and changed the shop. And this was the work that I was doing for my, my graduate thesis work in Chicago. And uh, it took a while to figure out what my, what my interests were in, in these spaces. But, you know, having the work in Hong Kong and the work that I was doing in Chicago and the kind of overlapping interests really kind of solidified for me what some of those some of those interests were. This gentleman opened, I think, the first bakery in Chicago that would have uh, you know, pan grandes, like the big breads, and and he has he's kind of like the Johnny Appleseed of 
bakeries in Pilsen who would like open a bakery, make it really successful and then sell it and then take a year off and then um, not work for a year and then open another bakery. And he's done this like five times over his life and all the bakeries that he opened are still there and owned by other people now. So lots of interesting things like that that kind of happen, you hear about, like learn about, you know, by asking people about how they, their livelihoods and how they're, you know, what you end up finding out that the, the kinds of contributions that people are making to the community and, you know, the long lasting things that exist because of that work. And the, the image before um, is his daughter who's now kind of taking over the bakery. Uh, photo studio in Pilsen, you know, I'm, which uh, also just recently I found out closed. One of the things I've always liked about small businesses uh, in, in particular is that a small business is a kind of wonderful place where family can exist in that space. Uh, so I grew up with my dad owning a small computer business in LA. And so I kind of took it for granted growing up, but I would spend like, I'd get off of school, I'd go, um, go, to the, go to their shop and I'd sit down and do my homework in the back and then I'd get bored and I'd go kind of cause some havoc in the store. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it never really occurred to me that that was all kind of by design, you know, for the family, you know, so my parents didn't have to have daycare, you know, they can take care of their kids and run their business and kind of do everything on their own terms. Um, so that's one of the things that I've always kind of enjoyed and liked about, um, you know, small business ownership in, in particular. This was a Indian restaurant in, uh, in Little India here in Chicago. Um, and it was, I think, really kind of telling that, uh, that you know, a lot of the a lot of the businesses I would encounter in, in Middle India, for example, employ a lot of Hispanic workers. So um, they're, you know, even though Little India is sort of an ethnic enclave for India and Pakistani and South Asians, um, they're employing a lot of Latino workers, for example. So the, there's, there's things like, like that that, uh, that I find really, really interesting and kind of really kind of inspiring that like, you know, there's, you know, the immigrant communities often are helping other immigrant communities in this kind of crossover in, in, a, in a city space like Chicago. This is a gift shop in Chinatown. Uh, this guy was really, really interesting and nice. He let me photograph in his shop. Um, and then I was, I wanted to do his portrait and he goes, well, I have to go pick up my, my daughter uh, from soccer practice. So um, I'm just going to leave you in the store. I'll lock the door and uh, I'll be back in 20 minutes. Uh, and then you can do my portrait. <laughs> so he just leaves me like I had just met him and he just leaves me in his store to, to take, to take pictures for 20 minutes while he's gone. There's an iPad on the counter. There's, you know, the cash register. <laughs> um, but the, the kind of just immediate level of trust that we had and that he, you know, he just kind of read me and goes, yeah, this guy's fine. He's not going to do anything. And, you know, I don't mind leaving my business. I mean, you would never see someone like at a Dunkin' Donuts, like say, hey, just, you know, just watch the store for me for 20 minutes, you know, after I just met you. So, um, you know, it's interactions like that as much as the kinds of, you know, spaces that people design for themselves and the, the, the non kind of corporate um, places. I mean, all of those things, it's just, it, I think it's something that uh, 
right now in particularly, I think we're lose. We're, I think we're going to end up losing a, like an even larger percentage of small businesses through this current crisis. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, from you know, these stimulus packages for helping small businesses. And, um, but for example, you know, undocumented immigrants, you know, a lot of them figure out ways to have businesses and are part, and that's a part of the community. And they're not going to have the kind of stimulus that, that, um, you know, citizens or green card holders have. So I think, I think we're going to see in the next couple of years, a big loss of spaces like this, for example, which I think is a real huge shame. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you one other project. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to, you know, drop them in. But uh, this is a little different of a project. Um, uh, but it's, th there's a, you know, social concern for me, uh, you know, recently having gone through school, having student loan debt, I think many people here can probably relate. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the things about student loan debt that's it's really hard to kind of grasp visually what what that debt can look like or uh, what or what you know how overwhelming the debt can be I think we all know that but um, sometimes seeing something visually at a large scale can get us to that kind of place a little easier so this project is about student loan debt and they're portraits of people with student loan debt. Um, and the images are cyanotypes, hand printed in the darkroom, but they're printed on handmade uh, paper. I'm gonna... There it is. Um, I don't know if you guys can see the close up of this, but the paper is made 100% from money. The paper is handmade, paper made from shredded $20 bills. So what I do is I make these individual sheets of paper that are 22 by 30. So the whole image is about 66 by 90 or 66, just about. Um, and uh, I make these larger than life portraits of people with student loan debt. And, Add, and use the amount of shredded money that's equivalent to their student loan debt. So like here is what it would look like on the wall. So like total that what you're looking at is about $28,000 and change in student loan debt. And the person in the image is the same, same woman pictured three times. There's actually nine and a half portraits of her for the student loan debt, her total of student let, loan debt being of just about just shy of eighty thousand dollars, so there wasn't enough room for all of it in the. Um, there wasn't enough room for all of it in the gallery space, so I showed a sample of it. But the idea being that you could walk into a space, and there's forty-five feet of handmade paper on the wall, equivalent to the person's student loan debt, um, and get, you know, a very kind of visual, visceral kind of uh response to what what student loan debt what the weight of it really is so this is my newest project um that's it's, it's a little bit on hold um because uh, i've been working on a new project for my fellowship um so i've been not had time to get into the dark room and finish the last i finished six of the nine portraits um, so I, I've made the paper for all of it. So I've made the paper equivalent to her entire deck. Um, but I need to get in there and print the last two or th the last three or so. Um, and then I need to try to get the work out and, sh and have it shown in some places. Um, but uh, one of the things you can't see super well in these documentation images is that I don't know if anyone's ever held up a uh, a $20 bill to the light uh, and you see a little plastic strip that, you know, says 20 in it. Um, well, there's, so when the paper's shredded, there's these little plastic bits and you can see that it says 20 
Um, they, but they kind of shimmer when the light hits it. So there's like this kind of sparkle to the image on the wall. Um, and I hang the images um, with, um, this is before I painted the magnets, but um, like you can see here, there's the magnets not as visible as it is here. So I, I paint the magnets to match the paper better. Um, so then there's, so that they kind of blend in and you don't have the little dots and it just looks like the paper's kind of floating on the wall. Uh, so, uh, and this was kind of prior to, this was while I was installing it that I took these pictures. So. Uh, if anyone has any questions uh, about all this, we can, I can field anything you, you want. Um, but just to give you an idea, this is all my personal work. Um, this is the stuff I'm do I was doing in school and whatnot, uh, but I'm also a working editorial and commercial photographer. Um, I have some stuff pulled up. I can show you briefly kind of like how I make my living because um, none of these projects have made me any money that I've shown you. This is just the stuff I'm doing to get exhibitions and, um, you know, kind of further my, my personal academic and, uh, you know, kind of gallery, gallery and or kind of museum trajectory. Um, although now I do have a, a gallery I'm working with and finally sold, like, sold an image recently uh, at Photo LA. So that's kind of nice to make some money from the work that's, you know, personally important to me. If anyone has any preferences, if anyone interested in seeing the commercial and editorial work I'm doing? Yeah, show some of that work. I think that would be great to see it. Thank you. So uh, anyone here play video games? Math Some people play video games. <laughs> so uh, I used to be a big gamer when I was in high school, late, right after high school too. Um, so I I work with a, 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 a magazine called uh, Polygon.com. They're owned by Vox, V-O-X, who does a lot of those really cool videos with all the graphics explaining cool stuff. Like, you know, like I saw one that they did on like why the Syrian war was as complicated and really great kind of graphic um, video that they put together. Um, but po uh, Polygon's really great because they do these really in-depth stories about the video game industry. So these are some portraits of um, the people that worked on StarCraft. Um, and like, I think the, the one of the, some of, he was the VP or something of, of Blizzard uh, who, you know, um, you know, who makes this game. So I got I get hired I got hired to go and photograph their original artwork for the game, um, do portraits of the you know portrait figure pictures of the sketches and portraits of the artists, um, you know it's like they had these early models of some of the characters, um, you know, and then so I I did this stuff and get some behind the scenes photographs of like their campus and how it was set up. Um, and uh, I did a similar one for um, Final Fantasy. So this is the guy that designed all the characters for Final Fantasy VII. And uh, so this, some of these pictures are from another photographer, um, but uh, like I did a lot of the portraits for this. It was, and then I did all these images of, the, of merchandise and memorabilia, memorabilia connected to the game. So this is a, this is a really long article. Um, it's an oral history about how the game was made. It kind of changed video gaming. It was the first game with 3D, 3D graphics. Um, so I'm trying to pull up some of the portraits. Like I did these pictures of the producer and the main artist who did, did the character design. Um, you know, did these, some of it's kind of boring, like, these, like this picture of this magazine, whatever. But well, what's interesting about it, if you're a gamer, is I got to get, I, they gave me all this stuff that you wouldn't normally have access to, and I got to sit there and like handle it and photograph it. And, you know, um, this is a portrait of the producer, uh, or the, to the director of the, of the game. Uh, so uh, they just remade the game, um, which came out recently. So this is kind of a, it's kind of like, these people are having their, their, their like, second coming of this game right now. Um, 
uh, connected to my interest in small businesses. And uh, what was really cool is I got to do this story about what it costs to run an independent video game store. And I traveled across the country photographing mom and pop video game stores. Um, you know, initially they wanted me to do these boring pictures of the outside like this. Um, but I literally drove from Los Angeles to New York and back in six weeks and photographed something like, I don't know, 20 stores or something. Um, and they just wanted these pictures and then, you know, maybe some pictures of the inside. Um, and I, so I, you know, because I was there and I wanted to do something that was more meaningful for me, I like, you know, I pushed them to let me do a little more. Um, of course they weren't going to pay me more, but I did, um, not only the pictures of the insides of the stores and the storerooms and, and all that, um, but then I, I did some portraits of the people that own the stores or work in the stores. Um, like this guy has the largest, one of the largest video game collections in the world. He literally collects every video game ever made. Uh, has it in a special vault. It's really kind of cool. Um, so I did these portraits. Um, you know, you can see there's a connection to some of my personal work in the way that I'm photographing the space and doing some of the portraits. Um, so it's always kind of nice when I get a paid job that kind of overlaps somewhat with my, with my kind of personal interests uh, or in, in my projects or even just in the way that I like to make images. Like they literally hired me to photograph an interior space the same way that I would be photographing something for my personal projects. So, um, those personal projects are usually what get me in the door to do these kinds of jobs. Um, and then additionally, uh, I do, um, let me see here. I do more corporate stuff like these headshots of these wonderful lawyers. <laughs> um, you know, this is the stuff that like really pays the bills. This is like, literally how I pay my rent for a year is doing like a job like this. Um, uh, you know, posing the lawyers and their space. So I, I literally just did everything that I, I'm still waiting for the check to come in for this job actually. Um, uh, this was done end of last year, beginning of this year. And so I'm photographing uh, some images of their new office space which they you know, kind of used on their website here. What was the, what was the, this one? I like that one. Um, I mean, they have a gorgeous office space, but uh, you know, it's, this is fairly boring to do, very kind of high stress stuff. Um, but, you know, a lot more kind of, produced or slick looking like this kind of stuff than the stuff that I'm doing, um, you know, my personal work, but yeah. Uh, and then also I do stuff like this. So I have like, I have a background in doing e-commerce. I used to be an e-commerce photographer right out of undergrad. Um, and so I did a lot of products photographing them on white. Um, so do this kind of stuff and I mean it looks really different than what I'm doing for my personal project I, at least I hope so <laughs> um, but uh, you know a $28,000 handbag made out of alligator <laughs> um, so yeah like it'd be really nice if I had like one of these jobs a year <laughs> Uh, and then I do photo booths, totally random, but I do these photo booth jobs where I set up these photo booths and people take pictures uh, at like weddings and corporate events and whatever. Uh, or, like I set up the lighting in the background and then people take their own picture. You can see like the little remote in her hand. She's like snapping her pictures herself. Um, so uh, it's like I had a job that was scheduled in March for 3M of all people <laughs> um, uh, doing their corporate like get together in Chicago, which was canceled because of COVID-19. Uh, just such a shame because I would have, I would have done the whole job in trade for some N95 masks. Um, but uh, uh, so hopefully this 
job, this job that, uh, that was canceled will come back later. But, uh, you know, a lot of my, I do a lot of event work, which I'm not showing you. Um, so I make my living doing stuff that's totally randomly different than, than um, what you see on my, on my website. So Jonathan, when you do all the event work, do you have a lot of assistants that work with you? Uh, so the, the corporate work, um, there's a bit large enough budget where I hire an assistant. So I had uh, one assistant and a, so one photo assistant slash digital tech and one, um, uh, one production assistant who's just sort of like, it's not, not important that they know photography. It's just more of like an extra set of hands to go go get lunch and you know, help carry stuff. And so I worked with myself, a photo assistant, production assistant. We had a hair and makeup, and then we had a stylist. Mm -hmm. So I had a team of five people, including myself, to to work on the stuff for the lawyers. Uh, the handbags, same thing. Um, we had stylist, hair and makeup, uh, photo assistant, production assistant. Um, so usually on those jobs, I'm working with a crew of anywhere from, you know, two to five people. Um, and uh, I did, uh, when I was in undergrad, I was, I used to assist for a photographer. You guys might know him in Texas, Dan Winters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I used to work for Dan Winters um, in LA. He's, uh, uh, he went to the same community college I did and my teacher introduced us. So I got to see you know, what is the role of a production assistant, of photo assistant, digital tech, and I worked in all those roles for him over the years um, and got to help do all of the pre-production work for, for those jobs, you know, like all the planning and things you do before the shoot. So I got to, I got a pretty good education in how to produce a large shoot, you know, you know, working on a thing where you're doing something for Target Grocery and there's literally a crew of like 40 people. Wow. Um, and, you know, having to help put all that together. Um, so uh, I'm by no means doing jobs that large, um, but uh, I've got enough of a background in it that I feel like I could do those things and hire the right people to do those things. So um, yeah, uh, like I said, the, doing one of those jobs a year would be like perfect for me. It wouldn't be enough to burn me out, but it would be enough to like keep things going so I could spend a lot of time on my personal projects. So, so in the light of the, the current circumstances, did you rush out to photograph all of the small businesses that you're afraid might be closing? No, I'm, I'm, um, I'm following the guidelines to stay home. Uh, I'm probably more concerned than I should be, but like I don't have a car, so I, you know, riding public transportation all over the city right now doesn't seem like a particularly good idea. Um, uh, additionally, I think I, I kind of fall into some slightly higher risk categories with, you know, uh, diabetes and asthma, sleep apnea, a couple things. So uh, I'm, I think I'd like to uh, go back and try to, uh, but all those places are closed anyway, so I can't really, a lot of them are, I wouldn't be able to get in and, you know, I think if they're, I think if they're gone, I don't think there's any way for me to photograph like the, tr I mean, I guess I could photograph if they were moving out, but I don't know. Um, I think part of that change is also just interesting. Like I'm going to go, I think what I'm going to do is go back to some of those places if they close down and f see if I can photograph the new places that are, that are there. Um, you know, the new businesses that come in, if they come in, um, yeah, I haven't really, it's, 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 I'm in this place where I've got so many projects I want to do. It's really hard to find the balance for, cause I'm, I never consider any of these projects really done. Um, like the car culture project I've been photographing. I did some new stuff in 2020 and 2019. So I've been working on that project for 10 years. And then when, so whenever I'm in LA, I work on that project. Whenever I'm in China, I work on the Chunking Mansions project. When I'm in Chicago, I try to work on my immigrant owned project and my student loan debt project. Um, but I'm also working on this new project with my fellowship, which, um, you know, is kind of all consuming at the moment. And I have a very set deadline and time to be working on that. Can you talk about the fellowship a little bit? Yeah. So uh, it's uh, connected to Heartland Alliance and Columbia College Chicago. It's a 
for graduate students who are, so any of you who have an MFA um, and would be willing to relocate for a year to Chicago to make a socially engaged photography project, I highly recommend you apply. I think the, I think the deadline is extended to the end of the month now. Um, so I think there's still a couple of weeks to apply for the next round. Um, but the, it's, uh, Heartland Alliance um, has a lot of, um, they're an anti-poverty organization and they do a lot of um, work, uh, it's funny, central cameras right here. Um, uh, they do a lot of work with um, immigrants, refugees. So for example, they help newly arrived refugees get resettled in the city, get them housing. Um, and uh, I've been photographing in the apartments that are set up for the newly arrived refugees. So I, I go and I've been photographing in those apartments before the refugees arrive, but usually it's like hours or minutes before they arrive. So I'm documenting the spaces, literally what they look like before, the, before that person arrives to their new home. So they, in these places, they don't get any say in what their apartment is going to be or what things are going to be in that apartment when they arrive. That's all done by a team of uh, at Heartland and volunteers that they work with. To, so um, it's really good work that people are doing, but you know, the reality is that you know, the spaces are really sparse. They don't really feel like homes, um, uh, but they're not empty apartments either. Uh, so they, they, they're kind of in this really in-between space where they look like someone's supposed to be living there, but all the little things that would identify that someone's living there are kind of missing, you know, all the personal effects. Um, uh, I'm also, so there's, they also run these shelters for unaccompanied children. So kids that are showing up on the Southern border of Mexico, um, they run the International Children's Center, which is a basically a youth, it's a youth shelter where children who uh, they mainly send up the non-spanish speaking kids so uh, most so heartland kind of specializes in running shelters for 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 with a more diverse group so like you you have kids from india coming over the border in mexico you have kids from china kids from different african countries and you know some of them are french speakers some of them are mandarin speakers you know to speak punjabi or whatever so um a city like chicago is better equipped with the resources not only the cultural resources of staff there that speak those languages and know those cultures and and um and things like that but they also have better you know there's maybe like a larger health uh infrastructure so they have like better mental, they might have a larger selection of people to work in mental health with the kids. So Heartland runs these shelters. Um, and uh, I'm, I've been working with permission to then go in and photograph in these spaces, not photograph the kids themselves. There's some privacy concerns with photographing the children, of course. So uh, there's a connection to my, to my work with immigration. Um, um, but I'm kind of largely looking at all of the programs Heartland does, English classes that they run. Um, and uh, hopefully building up part of a, a project or something that will lead to a bigger project that kind of breaks down the, mo the monolithic idea of immigration or immigrants. Um, you know, an asylum seeker's experience is very different than a refugee. You know, a refugee is granted status. They have certain rights um, and privileges because they've already been granted status. But whereas an asylum seeker is in a very tenuous situation and they might be they might be having, they might be not granted that status. So they're living here, working here as an asylum seeker, but that could all change in a second. The same thing is true for a DACA recipient. You know, someone who is a DACA recipient may have grown up here thinking they were an American and then suddenly found themselves in this space where they're, they realize that they're that they're they're not a citizen and they they don't have those privileges and rights. Um, so uh, you know, and then there's people who Im immigrate here like in a green card and how and have a you know very set specific status and rights. Like my wife, who's a recent green card uh, a permanent resident. You know, uh, so I'm kind of interested in 
I don't know how it's going to come together or <laughs> if I'm going to be successful. These are just some of the things in my head that I'm trying to incorporate into this project somehow. Um, and it's all come to a screeching halt because of the lockdown. So uh, I had been working for months on writing to people and emails and getting permission to be able to access the spaces I needed to get introduced to the right people to then, you know, like discuss what I wanted to do with people and see if they'd be willing to collaborate with me with this project. And all the kind of things were lined up and ready to go. And then literally the week that I was going to start photographing the lockdown starts. And so everything is just completely on hold. Um, so I may be completely changing tack and doing something online. Um, and I may, um, I, I may have to just wait and do the project later. I don't know what kind of access I'll be allowed to have. Like if my project then needs to spill over into past September, there's going to be a new, um, new f a new fellow coming in and you know, they may not have the bandwidth to help that fellow and allow me to do my thing. I don't know. So um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's in a really unsure place. I'll, I will be doing something, but um, if all the things I wanted to do will happen, I don't know. Then again, um, I kind of have better access in some ways than most because my, like my wife was taking English classes at Heartland Alliance. Um, which is one of the places I've been visiting. So when I started visiting, I, I realized, you know, they have these free English classes. My wife could maybe use these. So she started going. And then uh, I found out about a job at these shelters for these children. So my wife just got a job at the shelter. So now my wife is going to be working where I'm supposed to be photographing. So uh, it's weird how all these things kind of come together. But um, I th I'm hopeful that it'll all come together eventually because of just I'm becoming kind of a part of the Heartland family in an extent as an extension through my wife now. So. You have a particular, is there a particular obligation for something that you have to turn out at the end of the fellowship? Yeah, but they, they really try to stress that that's not important, <laughs> which, okay. yeah, like, you know, like that, the, 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 the process and the journey is the most important thing. And that if it were some online presentation, that, that's fine. Like, don't, you're not, we're not supposed to be thinking in a end result, like make everything fit into this end result. I mean, they do say that there's a solo exhibition in September, um, but uh, it's not necessarily, like, it doesn't have to be that. I can, I, I, I can say, no, it's going to be this other thing, um, so. Cool. So do you guys have any questions? Adam, did you have a question? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, hey, Jonathan, thanks for the talk. That was really great. Um, in, in, in particular, it was kind of great to go down like memory lane a little bit. I used to live in Pilsen. Like, nice. Uh, Panaderia for bre for breakfast on my way to teach. Where in Pilsen uh, did you uh, did you live? Uh, I was on. Oh man, it was Levitt and Nineteenth. Uh, okay, I'm on Twenty First and Wood, like yeah, like close to Cermak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I had a studio at, at uh, Mana. Um, oh, great! I, yeah. So jealous. That's like the. So if people don't know, Mana Contemporary is kind of like the spot for uh, the kind of hottest working artists in Chicago. Like everyone who's a who's a like kind of hot working artist in Chicago has a has a has a yeah. spot there. So I could walk. I can see Mana from my window. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I so ideally one day I'll have a studio there. And I can just walk down to my studio and walk back. And I'd be like. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So the photo people would know, but Barbara Katzen has a studio in there. I know Barbara Katzen. Yeah. She's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually one of the, in the photos of the law office was a painting by one of my studio mates that I had when I was there, um, which is another funny thing. In but the, I, in, in the lawyer's office, which yeah. uh, one of one of the murals? Uh, no, it was a painting, but it was, it was, maybe it was a mural. I don't know, but it was one of, it was like a concentric circle thing. Really? That's, that's funny. Yeah. Small world. Yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you about the, the, um, the, the work you have up uh, with us here. I unfortunately didn't get to see it, but I liked hearing about it and seeing it on your website. Um, and you talk a lot about like... Here, I'm going to stop sharing my, stop sharing my screen so I can see. Yeah, cool. Is. Like the, the, those, those businesses and like um, the longevity of them and then them maybe getting pushed out. And I know in particular in Pilsen, that gentrification has been a long-term issue and it's like become like a really pressing issue recently surrounding things with like uh, Danny Solis and like other kind of things with like the neighborhood, like the, uh, the Fisk power plant, you know, that just 
Yeah, the gentrification uh, issue is interesting because uh, when I go and I talk to um, business owners yeah. it, versus people that are kind of community activists, it's a very different response. Um, so a lot of the business owners will tell me, oh, I love the gentrification. And these are like, you know, you know, Latino working class, you know, like people who own their businesses in, in Pilsen. And they're like, yeah, you know, all the new people that moved to the, like this guy who owned a hardware store, he was telling me, he's like, all the people, he's like, I'm the last hardware store in Pilsen. He's like, but all the new people that moved to this, to this area, you know, um, they frequent my store and they, they support my store. And, um, you know, at this other place I was at, um, this woman was telling me about how, I don't know, it was maybe 25 years ago, someone walked into their hot dog stand and shot someone in the head right in the store. And how that, you know, the gentrification has made the place a much safer area of Chicago and their business is doing really well. And she, she's a fan of the gentrification. Sure. So, and, you know, people, so largely the people that are community activists that are thinking about the gentrification, it's all, it's the Latino community. Um, but people forget before it was a Latino community, it was a Czech community. Yeah. You know, um, so there's, there is sort of this natural progression in a gentrification cycle where, you know, things will shift and move. And of course, there are going to be people that are pushed out because of cost of living and things like that. And I, I'm not saying that gentrification is good, like 100% full stop, but I think it's a much more nuanced conversation than a lot of people like to have. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, me moving to Pilsen to be a graduate student at Columbia College Chicago, like I, you know, am I a gentrifier? You know, um, I'm, you know, I'm, am I not? Like, you know, I mean, I'm not from this area, you know, like, is there some, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a really, you know, I think, I think because my last name's Castillo, I'm half Mexican. I kind of fit in this place where like, I'm probably not going to be like, you know, talked about as, part of the quote unquote problem, but like, you know, I'm, I come from my, my family would, would have been lower middle class. You know, I had a lot of advantages growing up. I'm going to get an advanced degree in the city. Um, you know, like I could very much be considered part of the problem in the, in the, in, in the neighborhood if you really wanted to get into it. So, um, but it, you know, I don't know, is it, it's, it's interesting. You know, I think what's, I think what I, where I kind of, fall in this is that if you're going to move into a community um you should be supporting that community and the businesses there and um i think i think when places get corporatized that's the problem you know like the moment the starbucks moves in that's it <laughs> like that's when you know it's not even it's not a matter of small businesses anymore you know or, but like you know the trendy little record store that moves in on 18th street which is probably there when you live there um you know uh, pinwheel i think pinwheel records or something like that you know to, to most people that's a sign of gentrification but you know that's the guy who owns that shop is doing you know bringing it may be not be what's traditionally in that neighborhood but they're bringing something to that neighborhood you know um and in a similar kind of um um diy small business um aesthetic that i think is something that i appreciate you can see in all the work i'm making you know in the, in, in for that project so um I chose to highlight immigrant owned businesses particularly, um, but I had been originally, when I started the project, I was photographing in a lot of small businesses. And I think I'm gonna edit out a section that is, I think my, my friend came up with a name for the project, he called it Sovereign Spaces. Um, and I really liked the idea of like places that people have ownership over and um, can design them in their own quirky way and exist in a way that, um, you know, is on their own terms, so. Thanks. Sorry, I don't know if that answered the complete no, question. No, that's great. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of conversation I wanted to hear you talk about, about like like the kind of like, you know, just the politics of it, the idea of gentrification, you know? 
Yeah, the, 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 the thing about the politics of all this stuff is really interesting because, for example, the, 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 the shelters that I'm trying to photograph in with my fellowship, there's, there's a group of the Democratic Socialists of America in Chicago have actually been protesting these shelters um, because they're associating them with the Trump administration's um, you know, separation of children from their families. Um, and it's really a very false equivalency because you know, a child shows up in America without their parents, what do you do? Do you just like say, okay, go wherever you want to go? Like they're, they're children, right? You know, some of them very young. Um, so the government is responsible for finding their parent or guardian, you know, a relative who they can then be placed with while they go through their immigration proceedings of, you know, either being deported or being granted some kind of status here. Um, and so Heartland contracts with the Office of Refugee Resettlement to take care of these kids. They, there's some, uh, there's, you know, the English classes, their school, they feed them, clothe them, take care of them there. There's full health facilities. So kids climbing the border wall falls off and breaks his leg, needs a surgery. That's all covered and paid for. The kids, are, the kids have been traumatized through their journey and they need mental health professionals. That's all taken care of. Um, so, to me, uh, like, it doesn't make sense that you, you know, and a lot of these kids are victims of trafficking, you know, they're going to go to their uncle who just happens to own a chicken farm in Ohio. Um, so <laughs> I love the cat. Uh, you want to make sure that like these kids are not being further victimized, you know? Um, so it's, to me, it's very short sighted to protest these centers and say, shut them down, let the kids out, let them go wherever they want. When you could be saying, give them over to the traffickers who were, you know, potentially going to have them go work in our agricultural industry or even sex trafficking, you know? So, um, things are, it's really interesting to me because I think like a lot of the things I'm, you know, interested in, the conversations are usually very black and white. It's like for and against nothing in between, but it's never that, simple nothing's that simple and everything's very nuanced and we don't have enough nuanced conversations about these things and kind of thread the needle um which i'm i'm i hope a lot of my work can contribute to those kinds of things i try not to make my work be this like blanket this is bad this is good i just want people to think about things in a way that they maybe hadn't thought about or just maybe when they see the images, they want to ask more questions and have a conversation with me or someone else or, you know. So I was wondering, um, Matt, do you have any questions? Or Chris? I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you don't have a question, it's cool. I just wanted to give you an opportunity since I, since I brought Jonathan here really specifically for my class Initially, I just wondered, if you don't have any questions, that's fine. I just thought Yeah, I the questions don't have to be about uh, yeah. my particular project. If it, it's, it's about, you know, a career in photography, that's, I can answer stuff like that too, you know. Um, at first, the questions I was going to have, like, pertain to how you approach people um, to do, like, pictures of their places, because... I've done that where I've tried to also take pictures like during photo walks and like, you know, it can, it's awkward at first asking people to take pictures, but then like, you know, it's either yes or no. So it becomes pretty easy for, uh, after a little bit. Uh, but I guess going to your point now in like a career photography, um, I have to think a little bit, uh, I guess advice for, networking and kind of presenting yourself as a professional it would be you know or as someone to do the job that they need like that would help let me uh i'll address the first question about like approaching people mm -hmm. so um one of the things so first you got to find either a place or or some, some whatever is interesting to you that you want to photograph, right? So say, maybe it's just your neighborhood where you're around, right? Um, and I usually come up with a, a very short, I mean, like, you can call it like an elevator pitch, like, you know, if you want to talk about like, but it's just basically, you need people to know really quickly 
what you're interested in, why you want to take their picture, and then you need to show them examples of the kind of images you'd be making so that they can visually understand what you want to do. Because taking a picture is really vague. It's like, I want to take a photograph of you or a, but like what kind of photograph, right? Like, is it going to, what's it going to look like? And you may not have those when you first start. So you're going to get a lot more no's. Um, but like what I would do at my, ch in front of my chunking mansions work is I would, on my phone, I would put a little portfolio together of, of um, some of the images. So I just like put them on my phone of some of the ones I've done previously. So once you have like two images or three, even just one image that you've done previously, I can, I can just be like, Hey, this is, this is an image that like I, an example of an image I'd like to make of you. And so, so I find like this is a really helpful thing if, a, if there's a language barrier. So like when I was in China, people, I, my Chinese was terrible when I first got to China, but you know, I needed to know where to go and where, like, I needed to know where to go and like, where, you know, like, <laughs> like it's reversed, huh? It's flipped. It says, where's the toilet? Uh, <laughs> so like I would make these little flashcards in Chinese with the phrases I wanted, you know, and it would say like, um, uh, for example, I would do these for my, so it's, it would say like, my name is John. Uh, I'm a photographer from America. This is my hobby because I am not a journalist in in China because that's the number one way to like get yourself like in trouble with the police. Uh, these are my photographs. I'd show them my photographs. I'd like to photograph you. You know, I keep it. Um, these photos are for an art project. You know, so to give people like a very basic, simple, like context of like what I'm doing and here's an example and the, the pictures will say so much more than you can say it's like i want to do a picture like this of you um you know when like i don't even speak chinese and i didn't even speak chinese now i speak a little bit and my wife would help me you know but um you know that would that would work showing people an image is the number one way i would be like oh yeah okay i can i can see how i could fit into this um the other thing is if you're going to photograph people's spaces that's usually less threatening to people than a portrait you know or less invasive sometimes so you might photograph you might ask to photograph someone's the outside of someone's house and then come back and then show them those pictures and then ask if you can do a portrait of them and make it a much longer term kind of um relationship with people than just let me take your picture and move on um, you'll, f I find that the more I return to a place and make images over time, the richer the experience and the better the images are. Mm -hmm. Um, and you get to know all kinds of things that kind of go along with those images that you can, you know, you can talk about them as well better. Um, so as far as, uh, like a career in photography and, you know, like doing magazine work, for example, most magazine editors don't care at all about the magazine work you've done previously um, that I've encountered. They like to see your personal projects. So those personal projects will get me in the door and will then often land me the jobs that I want to do because they want to hire you for the things that you're interested in doing and that you can bring a certain vision to. They don't want you to, I mean, they can hire anyone to do that routine headshot. And they'll still hire you to do that routine headshot or that, you know, of, of that person. But uh, the stuff that usually gets you connected to people is that personal work. And the, the hard part is meeting those people and getting your work in front of them. So uh, you can email people directly and send them your portfolio and then ask for a meeting, like all the editors that are in New York. Um, but uh, sometimes I meet people through portfolio reviews and it sucks to have to pay money to go to those things. Um, but I have definitely gotten opportunities and jobs from going to portfolio reviews. Um, I landed a job once the very next day from an editor that I met at a portfolio review. The next day she hired me to photograph um, someone in LA. So um, if you're interested in 
more of that, like, like how do you get your work in front of people? You can feel free to email anyone, feel free to email me and I can discuss any of this further as well too. Thank you. Appreciate it. I think we probably need to wrap it up. I just want to tell you how much we appreciate you doing this, Jonathan. Thank you so much. This was really great. I really enjoyed it. Can y'all turn off your mutes and can we give him a round of applause? <laughs> a Zoom applause? Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And thanks everybody for coming. Y'all have a good Friday if I don't see you again. Thank you. Yeah, keep, keep in touch and anyone that's uh, seriously anyone, it's an open offer if you want to ask me further questions or, you know, if I can help you with something. Cool. Thanks so Thank much, you. Jonathan. Take care. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.